Hello and welcome to another episode of Wheel of Horror, the podcast where two best friends spin a wheel once a week, it chooses the horror film and they discuss it. Today we are talking about 2003's Identity, and that was directed by James Mangold. I'm your co-host Alec. I'm Eric, and with us today is Montgomery Morrow, also known as Monty. Monty, welcome to the show. What's up guys, thanks for having me. Yeah, dude, welcome back. Uh, Monty was on, dude, I feel like that was like two years ago when you were on uh, talking about Exposure 36, right? That was a long time ago. Something like that. I mean, I feel like it was like early last year, maybe something last summer. Long time ago. That's such a sick movie. I know you produced it and you acted in it, but did you co-write it too? Uh, no, my brother wrote, Mackenzie uh, wrote and directed it, but you know, I, I helped here and there. I was definitely hands-on the whole process but uh yeah he definitely gets the credit for doing more of the work um but yeah it's uh on amazon prime apple tv and tubi so you can watch it for free now with that it's pretty cool oh. i like tubi big fan of tubi so shout out there tubi's actually like making original content too now i'm like where are you guys coming from like i kind of like this <laughs> So this movie, it's kind of funny. You recommended it, Monty, because I was like, I want to get you back on the uh, podcast. So you had recommended this movie. Literally never heard of it. Same. I'm sorry. I never heard of it. So many movies you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I just never saw that movie. But this, I was just like, I literally had no idea what it was. So give us, like, your history with it a little bit. And also, like, your history with horror. Like, because this is, this is a thriller, too. So I'm, I'm kind of curious why you chose this one. Yeah, I uh, I was actually really excited when you said you didn't know about it because I don't know something about when I was growing up. I mean, you know, it's early 2003. So, you know, it was like a good ripe age for me to be like soaking in cinema. And I don't know, I really loved this movie. It really stood out to me. I think I liked all the twists and turns and it seemed really smart to me. Yeah. So as soon as you said, you know, what's a movie you would want to talk about, I kind of just chewing around in my brain and then this popped up so i was really excited yeah that you guys had never heard about it. so i'm really curious just to hear based on the storyline and the twists and stuff what you guys think but we can get into that but in terms of horror i mean i just love film so i'm all over the place but i wouldn't say horror is something that i'm like running to but i do love going to the theaters and watching a horror movie and just reacting with everyone but I mean, you know, like all the classics I love, I think the thing really stood out to me as a kid, Oh yeah. you know, Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, a lot, a lot of the classics, you know, got a relationship with those for sure. Well, you actually showed me another film I'd never heard of, which is horror adjacent. It was that, was it Japanese or Korean? The one that we watched together. Oh, uh, The Cure. Yeah. I think it was Japanese. I think it's Japanese. That was so good. So, like, you you definitely have some, like, really, like, interesting choices for films that are, like, you know, they're they're scary, but they have actually have, like, a pretty good plot, too, which is kind of hard to come by with horror sometimes. So, I remember mm. that movie blew me away, Eric. We we should probably cover that in the future, Monty, if you want to jump back on for that one, because it's, 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 like, seven, but it takes place in Japan, I think, and it's just, like, it's just so uneasy. Hell yeah. Yeah, it's a 1997 Japanese psychological thriller. Um, it's really cool. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So this is kind of a, not the same alley, but this one too. It's like dream sequency, real story, but then it kind of devolves into horror a bit. And uh, yeah, dude, I enjoyed it a lot. But Eric, what did, what did you think? Honestly, I was pleasantly surprised by this movie. Uh, never heard of it. Matt, I haven't heard of it either. Some things were predictable, which we can get into. Other things weren't. But uh, I love a good whodunit. Big fan of Knives Out and Glass Onion, which are another like whodunit films, like who's the bad guy. This is big on that. It's a clue, you know? So uh had me guessing quite a bit. Little predictable about one thing, and I will get into that. But really, really like this movie. Yeah, it was sick. It. I, I keep saying this to people and they're asking me what I thought about it and maybe this is like a diss, but I, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like it's a little bit of a compliment, but it feels like a slightly watered down Stephen King story. Like, I feel like this could have been a Stephen King book, and but it's just like a little bit too, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, because the twist is so too out there. there. I don't know, but it feels like it could have been a Stephen King short story, right? Yeah, I definitely feel that. Yeah. I don't know. It just reminded me as like all these twists started unfolding. I was like, ooh, kind of reminds me of 1408 a little bit, but maybe it's just because John Cusack's in it. And speaking of John Cusack, <laughs> this cast is stacked. This cast yeah. is crazy. It's like everybody's in this. Everybody, you recognize everybody. 
Yeah, I think it's a really great cast. I think also I I had a huge crush on Amanda Peet growing up, so that's probably partially why I like this movie so much. But I mean, Ray Liotta, John Cusack are all really great actors. And actually, what's cool, it's funny looking back. I know I'm kind of jumping around, but James Mangold, like realizing that he directed it when I went back mm. watching this movie, and I was like, oh shit, like he is a great director and he's got a great filmography and has worked with some great actors and i found a video on youtube where they're talking about making this film and he was like i really wanted to get good actors because it's so easy to just have a horror film where it's just actors doing their thing but he's like in between the horror i wanted us to really like sink into these characters and i think you know i think the film is so much better because of the casting hell yeah and james mangold i just saw dial of destiny uh not too long ago uh, indiana jones i mean for a director to have Harrison Ford's last Indiana Jones appearance and also John Williams' last composing appearance. That's he's legit. He's a legit director director and he was he was this is a great movie. I mean, can I can I just go through his filmography real quick? Just the sure, big sure. ones. Let's do it. Nail yeah. it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Copland was his second movie. Girl Interrupted, Kate oh. and Leopold, Identity, <laughs> mm-hmm. Walk the Line. Oh shit. <laughs> 310 to Yuma. Oh, I love that movie. Night and Day, not great, but whatever. Tom Cruise, Cameron Diaz. I've seen that. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, then, like, a couple whatever movies. I guess these are TV series and did in 2012. But then The Wolverine, which is okay. But then he redeemed himself with Logan. Oh, shit. Then Ford versus Ferrari, and most recently, Indiana Jones and Dial of Destiny. So this guy is hitting home runs a good amount, I would say. Dude, 310 to Yuma is awesome. I know it's a remake, but that was my first Blu-ray, actually, that I bought. Because I was like, I want to see what the scenery looks like, you know, in a HD. <laughs> so, dude. <laughs> dude, James Mangold. All right, sick. Yeah. What a, what a spread of movies, too. Fucking... That's an insane. Like some movies are like night and day. It's like, eh, not your, not your best, but you got Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz in a movie. So, I mean, yeah, but it sounds like that's a hell of a resume right there. Insane. Yeah, seriously. And okay, and this movie did pretty well. I mean, the budget was twenty eight million and it made ninety, so it's like you know triple the budget. You know, not including marketing and all that, but still, like that's a profit. So you know, pretty good, pretty good. Also, big Amanda Peet fan. Sorry, I had to chime in there, Monty. I mean, there's a who done it and who doesn't think Amanda Peet is gorgeous. So, I know, this whole movie, everybody's just all over her too. <laughs> but, uh, so, I guess like let's get into the movie a little bit. So, it starts off with uh, the guy from Boogie Nights who throws the firecrackers, Alfred M- Molina, right? What's his name? Uh, Alfred Molina. Yeah. yeah, so he's he's like a, a psychiatrist who's kind of talking to somebody, we don't know who it is, it's kind of a vague voice, and, uh, you know, they're starting to talk about how he's, his mom being a whore and, like, being left alone and stuff like that, right? It, do we do we know it's a serial killer at that point? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, they talk about how he, he, like, killed four people or something. That That's kind of, like, why they're talking to him, it seems like. Okay, and they're, like... And more than four people, maybe. Okay, and they're deciding if they're going to kill him or not. Like, that was, like, the final act of, like, the governor is, like, we're going to put this guy to death or not. So that's why all these people are convening to discuss whether this guy's insane or not. Yeah, it's, like, opening, after the opening, the opening credits where we learn a lot of this stuff, there's that phone call where the other, you know, lawyer or something is, like, you know, they're taking him to get executed and blah, blah, blah. So that that kind of initiates the we got to pull everyone together and, and get the judge there to talk about it. Right. And it's like during the war storm in New Mexico's history. Like where, where is this? New Mexico or Nevada? Oh, Nevada. Cause they're near I think Vegas. it's Nevada. Yeah. Yeah. They're near Vegas. Yeah. So it's like a horrible rainstorms happening right now. And we start to meet a bunch of random kind of characters and interactions. And the movie is kind of a little bit all over the place. And then it all does come together but we meet John Cusack and this actress, and they're in a limousine, and she's the worst, and he's driving, and what happened? He hits he hits the woman. He hits a woman on the street. Yeah, so you see, um, I, it's interesting, though, how they, I, I think I thought this was interesting when I was a kid, of how they interconnect these characters, like the family of the young boy, they run over the shoe. Of Amanda Peet, yep, yep. Yeah, and then you, it cuts to her driving, and, she, and everything flies out of her suitcase. So it's like we start to see how they're interconnected, and then, yeah, the wife gets hit by the car, and then we get a little flashback of the crazy actress being annoying to John Cusack, who looks down and runs over this woman. 
Yeah, so they're all there's like a bunch of big beats right in the beginning. Yeah, we get the car hitting the person, you know, walking into this motel with a bloody person. Everything's really intense right from the start. So you are immediately engaged. I just want to say some classic like freeze frames, you know, of the characters looking and it stops and there's the cool freeze frame that like cuts to flashback. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, well, was that referencing something? Uh, you know, probably. It's it's one of those things where I think we're sometimes we're so deep into the film worlds, we don't know who started what because everyone's copying each other. Right. But I know the big things that come up are like Hitchcock, right? And um, Hitchcock and that author. It'll come to me, but yeah, yeah, Hitchcock for sure. Let's come back to that as we get further along in the plot. I have a theory on that too. Oh, boy. Cool. Freeze, freeze fra- frames. Oh shit. Oh, Agatha Christie. That's the other name. Her, her like type of storytelling. Mm, okay, yeah. So most of this, the story then takes place at this motel where you know John Cusack and the doctor from Scrubs, John McGinley, they're going into uh, this motel where Eric. Did you recognize the, the same actor from what was it last week? That's insane, dude. Isn't that crazy? That's such a small world. We were just watching uh, I still what you did. In the- uh, last summer, yeah, and he was in that, and we were talking. Oh yeah, this guy from you know, uh, Eastbound Perfect and Storm down. and Eastbound and Down, and it's like, how does that happen? Where we run? I haven't seen this guy. It's like, it's, it's like, I'm seeing him week after week now. It's insane. It's crazy. The actor that plays like the uh, the guy that hates Amanda Pete, who's like the motel owner. Well, the motel in quotations owner, right? Like, yeah, you know, John Hawks. Who plays Larry, I believe. He just keeps coming up constantly in the podcast, and we're like, yeah, we haven't like seen or talked about this guy uh, yeah. in like 10 years, and now he's like on, constantly <laughs> on our mind. A weekly occurrence. <laughs> but yeah, so he's he's uh, the guy that owns the, uh, or what we think owns the motel. But by the way, we're going to be spoiling this movie hard. It's hard, it's hard, because there's so many like things going on that we're going to just be all over the place with this movie. Yeah, so just fair warning, big spoiler alert. I mean, you know. I mean, if you're listening to this podcast i hope you saw the fucking movie yeah right like, yeah yeah alec you do this every yeah, time I like, know. obviously if you're listening to an identity podcast you've seen identity all right, all right, all right. if you haven't go pause this and watch it and then come back and you know start it start at this point exactly <laughs> so yeah so basically we're introduced to this couple this young couple it's um oh my god what's her name clue or uh, clay duvall and um whatever her husband and they're this weird couple that goes to the motel. Then we get the wife who got hit by the car is bleeding out with her son and her husband. We get John Cusack and the actress. And that's it. We don't meet Ray Liotta. He comes later. Yeah, he shows up a little a little bit later. Okay. So that's the stage is set. We know where we're going to be. It's pouring rain. Everybody's at the motel. And then what's the first interaction that causes everybody to go crazy? I think John Cusack finds the actress's head in the laundry room right is that what it is yeah her phone finally charges so she walks out grabbing the shower curtain to stay dry in the rain and starts you know following the bars if you will which is a is a nice throwback to early 2000s i feel like Mm. Uh, finding service by holding your phone up and just walking in certain directions oh yeah Seriously, Eric, your basement was like that. It was like one little area you could actually get service. <laughs> yeah, dude, my my mom's basement totally. Yeah. <laughs> it was a horror movie waiting to happen. We'll say that. <laughs> I love that. But they find her head in the the dryer or the washing machine with the motel key that says ten or eleven. Right. What was it ten? I think ten. Ten. ten yeah. Mm. So we don't know what that means yet, but pretty quick you're like, ah, okay, because everybody just nine, eight, whatever. So it goes down, down. But I thought at that point Ray Liotta was there because, like, didn't he say like I used to be a cop? Like, there was that whole like that was that was yeah. So Ray Liotta showed up right after. So he brings the body in, and he's like, she, like the 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 guy from Scrubs brings the body in of his wife, and he's like, she's bleeding. I need a I need a phone. And then Ray Liotta's also he has a convict with him, and then shows up because we learn that both roads either way you go are flooded you can't go either direction so right. what's in between uh-huh. it is this hotel so you're stuck here so he's there can't radio in for some reason or obviously you, even if you can radio in there's no way to get an ambulance there so mm. and we know why he can't actually radio in we'll find out that later dun 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 but he but he, show, he shows up and he's like nice uh nice stitch job to the woman who's like he hit with the car and john cusick's like yeah he used to be a cop yeah and then they find the head and here we are okay did you guys recognize who the convict is i did what the hell who is that 
I know it's Jake Busey, but oh. what, what are you thinking him from? Starship Troopers. Yeah, yeah. That, that, oh, that, that's, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. just going to yep. say Star mm-hmm. Wars. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing my part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but dude, it's so crazy. I, I have to watch so many stupid shows at my job, and his fucking kid is in a movie too now. It's like, are you kidding me? There's a third generation of Buseys on like Disney cartoons now? I'm like, all right. Uh, <laughs> the, the Busey family, they're strong. <laughs> They're owning Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're the Baldwins of the 2020s. <laughs> so, so one thing I do want to talk about. So John Cusack hears like something rumbling in the laundry. So he goes over and, you know, there's a little suspenseful moment from like opening the different laundry, which like four are running. And then he finally opens the one that he's looking for. And then her head's in there. Yeah. Scary. And then the two other guys walk in and they're just like, what the hell? They weren't like, <laughs> They, like, kind of caught him in the act in a way. There was no suspicion at all. They were just like, oh, my God, what happened to this woman? Like, you know what I'm saying? Yep. I was thinking the same thing. I was just like, wouldn't they ask, like, um, weren't you her driver and all this stuff? Like, you're right. They didn't question her – or question John Cusack. He's just like, yeah, I found it like this. It's like, did you? You have blood on your hands. He's like, I, oh, I touched the head. Well, I mean, I think he quickly gets lucky because they're like, well, where's the convict? And then they go check, and he's gone. Right. So it's like – Either way, it would instantly be like, oh, okay, it was that guy. But, yeah, I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, I know. I, I had a weird feeling about John Cusack the whole time. I mean, he's got such, like, a nice guy face. You're just like, I trust him for everything. But, I don't know, something about him this whole movie, I was like, he's off. Yeah, he was a firecracker ready to go off. He's very calm, very cool, collected, mm. but he's ready to blow. Yeah. But he's also the nice guy. Yeah, yeah, no, it's and and he never won't be, you know. He's he's always going to be the nice guy, <laughs> <laughs> right? So yeah, I mean, the movie really just kind of gets into just like the mystery of it then, because obviously, like that's when the murder occurs, the first murder. So everybody's on edge, and then we get the couple, right? They're the ones that kind of start going crazy. Which also, I gotta say, the guy reminds me of my roommate so much. <laughs> like I don't like kind of looks like him, but also just the way he acts really had a little shotgun wedding. Not, I mean, not that kind of behavior, but I like <laughs> when uh, when John Cusack was going up to his car or whatever, and he was like reaching in. He said, "We don't know you, dude." Like that kind of thing. It kind of reminded me of a roommate. I mean, I don't think I don't think he was. <laughs> and like looking over his sunglasses too in the middle of the night and rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so they're the next couple that kind of gets into the shit. They get in like a stupid argument. Like she's like really emotional, and I guess it makes sense based on the ending a little bit more. Like why these characters are a little bit maybe like extremes of certain things. But I was kind of like, why is she fucking like losing her mind, crying so much? Because what did she think? Why was she crying? I can't remember now. But she she was she was she she they got married because they were she was pregnant, and but then they get back to the room. And she's like, actually, I'm not pregnant. Right. Yeah, but also, like, a woman's head was just chopped off and found in the laundry room. So, I mean, I, I don't – I'm not going to get mad at her for getting upset. <laughs> yeah. And then they're all like, all right, everyone stay here. And she's like, no, fuck that. Okay. All right, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. I mean, there's also that too, Eric. It's like she's like, I just made a really bad choice in my life and people are getting killed now. It's like, yeah, this is not a good right. <laughs> I got to come clean. Yeah. So the guy gets killed and his body's just like strung up in the uh, hotel room or whatever. And they all find him and he's like bloody and fucked up. And they find the like nine or eight key or whatever it was, right? Like one of the keys yeah. is like in, like, like somehow John Cusack like goes in between his arms, which like he'd never touch a dead body. But yeah, he, uh, he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to take my suspended cop license and double down and <laughs> reach in for the number nine key. And he finds it. He's like, these room keys. Yeah. yeah there's also a good there's a good moment in the bathroom where she's like you know upset crying he's banging on the door and then he kind of stops and you hear him be like what are you doing and then he starts freaking out so you're as the audience you're like what that like is he trying to kick the door open or something's going on you're really confused um and i thought they did a good job of that and then all of a sudden the door stops and you hear him kind of fall <laughs> And, and like you know, it's corny, but I, I think I think they. I, I remember. Wa- I mean, I'm watching this like 20 years later and being like, oh yeah, I, I like vaguely remember this happening. Mm. And that was a cool part of watching this movie again because I haven't seen it and I don't know how long. And you know, just finding those moments of like, oh yeah, okay, I, I'm starting to remember what this story and this happened, and so that was cool. No, yeah, I, lo- I love it because I've never seen this movie, but there's so many movies from this time period. I mean, Eric and I've covered so many of them that just like oh, yeah. just floods your mind with nostalgia. Like, do you, re- you ever seen Ghost Ship, Monty? You ever seen that movie from 2002? 
No, I don't think I have. This is better than Ghost Ship. I'm Obviously, <laughs> this is better than Ghost Ship. But I'm just saying, you know, we loved Ghost Ship from the early 2000s. I mean, there's a time and a place. And it was, like, kind of shitty CGI and stuff like that. We get, we get uh, So so back to the, the plot, though. We get, like, these dream sequences of the motel. Like, doesn't someone, like, leave the motel, the guy, the, the convict? He, like, leaves and then, like, somehow ends up back at the motel or something. Yeah, he, like, runs out into the woods, but then, like, comes... But then he, like, thinks he's escaping, but then he ends up back there. And then he gets, like, tied up, and then the motel owner, quote, he's the next guy dead, that convict, and the motel owner is blamed for it. Like, you were with him guarding him, so then they find a key by him, and it's like, oh, there's another key, right? Yeah, he has the bat through his, like, neck. Because his bat, yeah, his bat is, like, down his throat. Which is wild. And I do want to say that the convict running away, seeing lights in the distance, they're like, oh, there's another town. Which my brain was immediately like, why didn't anyone say, like, oh, there's a town that right, way? Right. But that's what's cool about it because, and this is the first kind of clue into, like, whatever the supernatural thing is happening. Right, right. That's when you, that's right when you go, like, something else is going on. Right, exactly. Because he, because you see him break into this, like, random barn or something and then all of a sudden he looks out the window and he just sees the motel sign and he's like what the fuck and then yeah john cusack sees him yeah yeah Yeah, that that moment and then the car explosion i was just like all right i have no idea what's going on anymore like i i thought this was real for a second but and and the other thing that's kind of cool is when the when the convict dies or whatever you know it would have been kind of lame if they were talking about him in the beginning of the movie so i'm glad it wasn't but like in my mind i was like okay so it is somebody different you know that immediately confirms that he's not the convict you know yeah yeah which i like that kind of twist too and watching it again i was like oh yeah i forgot about this little like you know the little reverse of the convict thing although i will say that i think you see a photo of the convict early on like in the opening so I think if you're paying close attention, you could pick up on it. But it's also like our brains are like, we heard convict and now we're seeing one. Right. Which is interesting as well. Yeah, but my brain totally did. It was just like, that's the I'll, guy. I'll, t- I'll tell you what I thought. That's the that. guy. Yeah. By that po- I did remember that watching this film. And I'll tell you what my brain thought going into this. And then what I predicted and what actually happened. I'll tell you by the end of this. But what else happened? So Larry's blamed for killing the convict. Larry like goes to take off and he's like rushing in his car. Like, I need to get out of here. And then he hits guy from scrubs with his car. Yeah. Just murders him. There's no way he's coming back. But his wife was also hit by a car earlier that night and still alive in a bed. But also we see that kid like about to get hit too. Mm -hmm. Who's a mute. He doesn't talk. He's always around when bad shit happens too. And that's a stepdad. And his mom is the one that's still bleeding out on the bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so we yeah, then they they find the other body, which first of all, it's pinned up against the dumpster, okay? And then, I don't know, 5 minutes later they come back out to get the body and it's gone. It's like, "Wait, why didn't you guys take it off then? You left him there like that? Like you didn't even try to get him out from Oh, like... he was dead. He was super yeah, but dead. Like, yeah, yeah, but they still, didn't even try. No, but not but I'm saying like pull the car out a little bit. Like have some respect for the guy. Like don't just leave him pinned up against a dumpster. I don't know. Eric, would you do that to me? If you hit me with the dump, you just leave me pinned up. You'd be like, well, he's definitely dead, so let's go play some fucking cards and we'll come back and I mean, for, I mean they kind of come back to him in a couple minutes. I know. I don't know. I, I might I might, I might, leave, I might leave you for a good five, Alex, and then I come back. <laughs> You're like, I gotta go have a beer and then I'll get see, out. See if, you have a, see if you have a key on you, which they kind of do. He has a key on him. Yeah. Before they find the key on him, they find out the woman's dead and then Ray Leo, the mother, has died. Right. We think of natural causes. Definitely not natural causes. She was hit by a car. <laughs> well, yeah, but at this point. But um, that's a good point. <laughs> but they find the key under her, and it says six, I think. So we skipped seven. So that's what makes them go out to Ray Liotta. I mean, uh, sorry, that's what makes makes them go out to John C. McGinley's body, mm-hmm. and they find the eight key in his pocket. I know. It's weird that they wouldn't already... Well, because well, they wouldn't have checked it because they would have been like, "There's no way. There's <laughs> no way this could be in his pocket." Who would put a key in his pocket yeah, yeah. afterwards? Yeah. Okay. So, anyways, right. the body's gone. Uh, so they come out and he's gone. So right now, the only people that are left are John Cusack, Amanda Peet, Kenny Powers' brother. Wait, I, I think we jumped because once they find the keys in John C. McGinley's pocket, is when they really start to panic. 
And this is when John Cusack runs to Clea Duvall and, and Amanda Peet and is like, take the kid and get out of here. Right. So Clea takes the kid and they run around the house or, you know, the motel to her car and then the car blows up. Mm-hmm. And it's once they like extinguish the flames of the car and they realize no one's in it is when they like, you know, Ray Liotta is like, it's your fault, John Cusack. You told them to get in. And then he walks away and then they cut to him looking and there's no body. Yeah. And that was the other yeah. moment where you're like, OK, well, they also talk about like Native American burial grounds before this, too. So you start to maybe think it might maybe that's that at this point, like teleporting their bodies away. I don't know. That's kind of where my brain went because I was like, I have no idea what's going on now. Yeah, and that's one thing that Clea Duvall's character is saying. She's like, I don't know, like they, you know, they put a bunch of like tribal people here or something, and then there was no water, so they all died. Like, so she, so she starts spewing the uh, conspiracy theory of that, right? And I, I fell for it before she roasts. <laughs> and, well, I love it too because like that car. I don't know how this works, but if it's pouring rain like that, could a car really light up that and stay lit like that? That that explosion is. I mean, cars don't really explode unless they're like full of. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's gas, but usually gas just it just it just consumes the car. But like that blew the fuck up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely have some nitpicks about the that whole car explosion during the reveal, but we can get to that later. We're gonna come back after we've revealed the ending, and we'll kind of yeah, we'll go bit by a little nitpicky. But okay, so most people are dead now. It's Amanda Pete, John Cusack. Kenny Powers' brother and Kenny Powers' brother. Oh my god, <laughs> who's the last one? The girl, the girlfriend. Uh, who else? Was no, so she's dead. So it's... no, she's gone. No, no, the uh, the the girlfriend of uh, the guy who was in the bathroom. The girlfriend who was in the bathroom. She's dead. She just right? blew up in the yeah, car. Yeah, she's dead. She got roasted. Oh, so, so yeah. she got blown up in the car. And the kid's dead too. Well, we... but all right. So now we've got yeah. So John Cusack, Ray Liotta, Amanda Pete, and Kenny Powers' brother, and they're all freaking out. <sighs> And they think that Ray Liotta is the killer, right? What what tips them off to him being the killer, though? I think, don't they, like, find out he's a convict? Yeah, so they're looking for flashlights, I think. And Amanda Pete goes into the co- his cop car. Oh, and at tr- first we see the wiring all pulled out or whatever. And then she goes into the glove box and sees the two profiles of the, the convict that we know, Busey, and then also Ray Liotta. So then we get the flashback of them which we did get a little you know there's a cool montage in the beginning where you see a little clue of everyone showing us that they're not really who they say they are Mm -hmm. like amanda pete had cash in her bag ray Liotta, he doesn't have his jacket on and there's a blood stain with a hole in his back so he covers it with his jacket right there's like a couple of cool moments in the beginning where you're like so we kind of knew something was up with him but this is really the reveal that we're getting now well also on top of the reveal they have like a moment where they're going through the licenses where they realize they all the same birthday of may something right may 10th yeah they they figure that out yes yeah they ask each other the birthdays because they even say earlier too it's like you're a tourist it's like me too and like they right. say that little, and then right. and then they're like well your last name is dakota my last name's rhode island your last name's washington right. and new york right there are a lot of good puzzle pieces there's even something that i noticed is there's a point where when john cusack is looking for the thread to stitch up the mother he looks at a photo on the desk of you know quote unquote larry's desk and it's a different guy uh, so that was like the real owner he's holding a fish and it's like kind of hard to i kind of remember yeah. that yeah yeah no i kind of remember that though. and that's literally when ray Liotta shows up so you see him he holds it up and then the car pulls up and the camera you know gets distracted and we see the car pull up and it, there's a lot of little like puzzle pieces like that right that you know i've only i was able to notice especially because i i'd seen it so many times yeah and that basically we kind of glossed over that uh, Kenny Powers brother he was a guy that just took over the motel like he didn't own it or whatever obviously what we're talking about right now so that gets revealed to that like he's just like I just stumbled in here and took over I found the guy dead and I took it over one day and it's like shit like that's all right but then Ray Liotta kills him and then I mean we might as well give away the ending now yeah well I mean there's a there's a fight once Amanda Pete realizes who Ray Liotta is she's like running around whispering for the other guys mm-hmm. and then there's a little tussle and that's what some peeps get shot <laughs> some peeps get shot yeah so she gets hit um and then we get a flash back or whatever like into the real world where we're at this 
hearing basically where this this judge is pissed off he's from texas he's the dad from donnie darko and he does not want to be there and he is just mad about everything uh, uh, alfred medino's there and we see john cusack tied up in a uh, straitjacket and yeah so basically we figure we think it's john cusack who's been you know the crazy guy the whole time but then we find out it's this other bald guy and he these are all personalities in his mind so this has all been playing out his head and basically alfred molino is trying to prove that the killer's personalities are dead and this guy really is crazy and he really has split personality disorder so the judge has to believe him so yeah this is it's an interesting turn in the film because the whole time we're kind of being like oh we want these people to survive or whatever and and we want to figure out what what's going on and then when we find out that like because we already know the bald guy is there. There's the shot where they're like, oh, the convict is here. And then the elevator door opens or whatever. And it's the bald guy. So we kind of are like, how are these two storylines connected? Oh, right. Because we thought the convict was the convict. He's not that. And then we finally meet him and he's this bald guy. But then it turns out that, yeah, John Cusack is one of the personalities in this guy's head. So like this guy thinks he's John Cusack. So we get this cool visual of John Cusack being tied up in the, Mm -hmm. you know, in the guy's like situation, whatever, in the straitjacket. And there's this cool way, you know, like we keep flashing back and forth between the bald guy and John Cusack in this, in the straitjacket. Yeah. No, it's a great, great twist. And I really didn't see it coming. I really didn't. I, you know, I, I knew, I thought somebody was going to be the person, but I didn't think everybody was going to be all different personalities in his head. And um, a lot of things start making sense where I'm like, why was Kenny Powers' brother such a dick to Amanda Peets? Like, right from the start, he's like, you're a whore. I hate whores. Whores, 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 whores. And I was like, oh, because his mom was a prostitute. And I was, like, things started really making sense. Right. And well, and then John Cusack essentially like given this mission of like you have to kill the killer, the personality that is the killer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so now at this point, as the audience, we're like, oh, it's Ray Liotta. He's the killer. He's disguised as a cop. And then John Cusack kind of comes back, but he's like away from the motel. So we then we go back to like, you know, he's been given this mission. Now he's got to finish it. And Amanda Pete's still getting chased by Ray Liotta. And they get in a fight, they end up getting shot a bunch of times, and uh, they both die. And Amanda Peets is left alone in the rain, and uh, John Cusack. And it's, dude, like, really cool to see John Cusack and Amanda Peet like, talking about, like, you know, I see you with, like, tangerines or, or, like, oranges or whatever. And then it cuts back to the hearing, and it's a guy talking to himself. And I, I thought that was sick. That was really good. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Well, do you want to hear? You want to hear my quick take as we're getting to the ending? Really quick before I forget, Eric, did you recognize yeah. one of the guys at the hearing? He was he was Doc Ock, absolutely. Yeah, and Indiana Jones. No, 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 yeah. no, no. He was he was the cop from Wayne's World, the guy that's like you know like oh like McKenzie's donut, <laughs> like definitely smell a pork product of some kind. That guy, yeah. oh, that's yeah. funny. <laughs> that guy is great. Yeah, that's hilarious. I did not recognize him at all. I, mean, I apologize, but. My takeaway is this. So they got this unstable schizophrenic at multiple personality at, at this hearing. And Doc Ock, uh, the, the therapist slash lawyer slash trying to prove that he's a schizo, is walking him through the personalities, which you feel like he's done this before and is so close to getting there. Oh, yeah. It ends with him killing off the 10 or so personalities in, in front of all these other like judges and whatnot. And it ends with Amanda Peet going to the Orange Grove. And it's like, you're back to Amanda Peet. You're in this peaceful Orange Grove now. Let's get you to your, like, low security place. And then we learn that the one personality that's left is the kid who is the killer. That was my takeaway is that, like, oh, we thought we narrowed down the personalities. And now he's at a peaceful stage now. And his one personality is left. But no, this whole time there's one personality that survived and it's the kid who, I'll say this, I never thought of the personality thing watching this, but I knew that kid was up to no fucking good this whole movie. (laughs) Why, because he didn't talk? He didn't talk and he was always fucking there. He like cried when his mom was dead, barely. Well, who wouldn't? barely but he was also in my car neck was bleeding out (laughs) there's what there's one shot that ruined it for me and it was like him walking in the room to check on his mom and i'm like yep and mom dead yeah that's it's the kid it's the kid it's the kid yeah it was a little it was definitely a little creepy they alluded to it for sure the car blowing up thing come on that kind i mean 
You didn't see the kid. You didn't see the body of the kid. You didn't see the body of the person right. either, really. But I mean, right. but but that means he ran away. No, fuck no, dude. There was something about that little shit kid, and he's the only kid. Well, in the montage, in the montage of showing him like doing all the killings, there's like a shot. Of, it's like the classic like action shot of him walking away from the car blowing up, which is like, how does this? I mean, I know it's all inside of this guy's head, but how does this kid know how to like? I don't know, like rig a car to blow up <laughs> That's when the like ignition starts. But it's it's all in this guy's head, which also makes me think like True. there's also borders, like there's borders between this guy's brain where you can't leave the motel. It's all in the motel. But you you get the sense from this doctor who's like, hey, like we've been through this. Like he's walking him through all the, and then they get to Amanda Pete, mm-hmm. and they think they're in this orange grove and they're safe. And the movie ends with the kid coming back and this guy killing once again which i think is a phenomenal ending yeah yeah it was cool because they're just driving him to like the yeah the mental hospital instead of him getting executed and then he ends up killing alfred uh, molina and uh the guy the the officer from wayne's world his name is uh frederick coffin yeah this was his final film he died right after the scene pretty young Mm. but but yeah ending was fantastic so yeah so i i just i want to know alec like i want to know what you thought because you had I mean, and also Eric, too, but definitely curious, like, what you guys thought of watching this movie for the first time, just overall thoughts. I was fully engaged the whole time because I just was like, I genuinely don't know what's going on and I can't wait to figure it out. And I think they delivered because, like, you know, you were, like, tricked and then there's even another bigger trick at the end. So I was really into it. It's great that you recognize, like, everybody in the cast because, like, you're like, I love almost all these people. I've seen them in other things before, so it's like, I'm comfortable with these people. So, I, I don't know. They did a really good job. I I thought the music was cool, too. It was Alvin Sylvest- uh, Silvestri, which is Back to the Future, Eric. So, oh, yeah. I'm very surprised it slipped under the radar for me. But I, I really I enjoyed it, man. So, thank you very much for recommending it. What about you, Eric? Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, I always thought the kid was up to no good. I do like that, you know, the scene where we cut back to the, the killer and it's John Cusack, right? It's not, not Amanda Pete. Yeah. Right. Because, because you get the sense that, like, he's the last layer of these the schizophrenia. And it wasn't. It ends with Amanda Pete and then the kid. So, I don't know. It was a good whodunit. There's no doubt. Uh, I always knew the kid was up to no fucking good. I never thought that kid was truly dead. And... I just never predicted the schizophrenic uh, multiple personality thing. Well, I also think that you kind of, as an audience, you're like, I want John Cusack's personality to win because he seems like the most reasonable, like, Mm -hmm. kind of vulnerable person there. Obviously, Amanda Peet is not a bad character. Right, but that's what I'm saying, that that, that the doctor thought that John Cusack was the last layer to go through, but he was wrong. Mm. I think that the little kid is actually the the real personality that was stunted because of all like the trauma that he went through, and then Amanda Pete is the best version of what he could be. You know, like this really nice, innocent person, mm. right? But John Cusack, yeah, it's like they have to shed all the layers. And John Cusack, even though he's the cool one, he's the one probably that the guy wants to be, he's not the most innocent one that he probably should be. So, yeah, it's like literally we ended on the personality of John, of uh, Amanda P. It's like everything's fine. He's going to this like small facility now. It's like, but wait, he has one personality left and it comes out at the end. And that's that's a yeah. really cool concept. And I really enjoyed this movie. Yeah. The only thing that made it tough for me for some reason doing a podcast about it is like everything looks the same. It's like all in like the night and rain. So like for me, I'm like, wait, what happened next? Like it was just really hard for me to remember like the sequence of everything. Every motel room looked the same. Yeah. Right so I love the movie, but for me to like, you know, recollect everything that was going on, I was like, wait, what the fuck happened next? Like, so it was tough for me, but, but I still love the movie, man. Yeah, I mean, something's cool. I was doing some research, and they filmed in, like, a big studio uh, in Culver City, where they obviously just had to make it rain for, like, two months. Um, I think it was the same studio they put, like, did The Wizard of Oz. So, cool little fun fact there. Is that why the droughts are so bad here? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And they created, like, a whole rain system. (laughs) Um, And I do want to say, I was looking at the awards of this movie. It was nominated for, like, 11 things. Nothing, Nothing huge. But it won one, so I was looking for the winner, and it was the Golden Schmoes Awards, which I'd never heard of. 
And it was the winner for the most underrated movie of the year. Mm. And I think that's just like the perfect way to describe this film. Like very underrated. I don't think a lot of people know about it. And it's actually good. So I I think it's interesting that that was the only win that I ever got. (laughs) Monty, one thing to add to that. Tomato. So Rotten Tomatoes, I always do the score uh, most of the time in the episodes. The tomato is fresh. It's a 63 However, you don't see this often where the audience score is significantly high. It's 75 audience score. And you're talking a, a critics rating reviews 171, 63%, 75% of over 100,000 people wow. saying 75. So everyone who watches this enjoyed it is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I'm an IMDb guy and it's got a 7.3 out of 10. So pretty, pretty lined up because sometimes Rotten Tomato and IMDb aren't always in sync like that. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I mean, clearly, yeah, that's so accurate. This is a clearly a movie that just went under the radar and you're like, that was like good. I'm sure James Van Gogh is like, why didn't people like this? Like, this was fucking good. I don't know. What were people doing in 2003? Just watching like old school and stuff? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what I was doing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, Monty, thank you so much for coming back on, recommending this awesome movie. Definitely want to have you on again in the future for any recommendations. We should do, what was it? It's The Cure, right? Yeah, it's just Cure. Cure, Cure. Yeah, yeah. just Cure. Yeah. We should definitely do that one if you want or any other one that you're interested in. Like, I'm boys, totally down. Throw it on the wheel. <laughs> boys Don't Cry, Cure? Or what Cure is this? Not no, that. no. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah. So, Eric, what do you say you spin the wheel? Ready. Spinning. Best women in horror. Another debate. <laughs> debate. Ooh, discussion. This love is a that. Discussion. Uh, debate. That spin felt real. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like I was there. So, yeah, so we're going to do another discussion episode of our, uh, our favorite female characters in horror. So, we're going to be covering that. We have Zach Simpson coming in. And uh, we actually have a little surprise for you guys next week. So we're going to be doing this the following week. But get ready for next week. And uh, seriously, get ready for next week because I'm really pumped about this episode. So check it out. And Monty, thanks again. We'll see you guys all next week with a big bonus episode. Thanks for having me, guys.